My name is Henry Dimbleby and I am leading the government commissioned national food strategy. I don't want to spend my time today talking about the what question. What would constitute a good food system? What might a fair, healthy, sustainable food system look like? Instead, I want to think about the how question. How do we end up here of all places? How do we end up with a food system that can feed the world but also makes us ill, that pollutes our rivers and our air, that has devastated nature and that produces almost a third of our greenhouse gases. How on earth did we end up with a food system that looks like this? Understanding any complex system is not an easy task. The food system is in fact a web of interconnected systems, everything from the way crops grow to the, the mechanisms of human appetite to the man-made systems by which supermarkets, for example, restock their shelves or companies decide where to invest their money. Each of these smaller systems is driven and connected by feedback loops, either balancing or reinforcing. Balancing feedback loops working against change, reinforcing feedback loops accelerating change. Our food system has developed a new and destructive reinforcing feedback loop and lacks a vital balancing one. The latter is why we're here today. To understand why, it helps to go back to the early summer of 1944. The Allies are beating back the Axis forces in Europe and the Russians have broken the siege of Leningrad. Across the Atlantic, an ideological young American biologist called Norman Borlaug arrives at a ramshackle research station just east of Mexico City to study the productivity of local farms. Borlaug grew up in a small farm in Iowa during the Great Depression. As a child, he witnessed starving people begging on the streets and rioting over food. He knows what poverty and hunger look like, but nothing prepares him for what he finds in Mexico. The living conditions of the half-starving locals horrify him. These places I've seen have clubbed my mind, he writes to his wife Margaret. The earth is so lacking in life force, the plants just cling to existence. They don't really grow, they just fight to stay alive. The levels of nourishment in the soil are so low that wheat plants produce only a few grains. I don't know what we can do to help, but we've got to do something. He thinks a solution might lie in breeding a new form of wheat, higher yielding and resistant to disease. He spends his days in the heat blasted fields, painstakingly cross breeding plants, tweezering off stamen, mingling pollens by hand and placing hundreds and thousands of tiny hoods over individual heads. He often sleeps on the dirt floor of his hut. The Mexican farm workers think he's crazy, but eventually his efforts pay off. Borlaug creates a whole new farming system. It's built on four pillars. His new strains of wheat, nourished by industrial fertilizers, watered by sophisticated irrigation systems, and protected by chemical pesticides. It's a muscular, turbocharged approach, overriding the complex web of feedback loops that comprise our ecosystem. It is concerned only with the cost of inputs per hectare and the output per hectare measured in tons of wheat. And on these terms, it is staggeringly effective. When Borlaug arrived in Mexico, the country imported 60% of its wheat. By 1956, Thanks to the strain he developed, Mexico was self-sufficient. The miracle was repeated in India and Pakistan and then across the world. New breeds of wheat, rice and corn were combined with modern irrigation techniques and industrial fertilizers and pesticides to create a new era of high yield, high input intensive farming. For the first time in agricultural history, thanks to Borlaug, and what became known as the Green Revolution, the increase in food production massively outstripped the additional land being farmed. And since then, the population has exploded from 2.5 billion to almost 8 billion today. If you remove just one of Borlaug's pillars, synthetic fertilizer, it is estimated that our food system, as it is configured today, would feed just half of those people. This is one of the great stories of human ingenuity. But it turns out that the, the very simplicity of Borlaug's system is also its Achilles heel. 
With its atomization of nature into its constituent parts, it focuses only on productivity without sufficient care for the system as a whole. The Green Revolution unwittingly set in train the failures we see today. The first of these is the failure of one of the most remarkable and complex of our evolutionary systems, our appetite. Through a series of delicately interwoven feedback loops involving numerous hormones, our appetite ensures that we eat what we need to nourish ourselves without our even thinking about it. This isn't just a case of being hungry or not. Our appetite gives us urges to, to seek out specific nutrients if we're short of them. It's an extraordinarily powerful system, hard to resist. Some people, for example, will, uh, if they're short of iron, will instinctively eat soil. It's a completely miraculous thing. But the human appetite is out of sync with the modern world. Because it evolved when calories were scarce, our appetite prompts us to seek out calorie-dense food, high in sugars and fat. It makes them delicious to us. And when we eat these foods, it delays our sensation of fullness, so we eat more of them. Unsurprisingly, food companies have noticed this. And as a result, they put more money into the development and marketing of these foods, often ultra-processed and low in nutrients, and made from the refined fats and carbohydrates that the green revolution has made so cheap. And as companies have invested more, so we've eaten more. And as we've eaten more, so we've become sick. This is a classic reinforcing feedback loop, a vicious cycle, a junk food cycle, if you like, a toxic interaction of appetite and commercial incentives. The second failure, and the reason we're here today, is what Partha Dasgupta recently described with such brutal clarity in his review for the UK Treasury, The Economics of Diversity. This is a failure brought about by the invisibility of nature. In almost all of the systems that we use to value human activity, nature is invisible. We do not value it in financial terms. A farmer, for example, who farms on rich peatland does not have to pay for the peat that is lost and the carbon that is emitted in the process, nor pass the costs on to the consumer. No one pays, and yet everyone does. The financial costs of environmental destruction and climate change are not factored into measurements of GDP or shown on the financial statements of our companies. And we're even further from finding a way to recognise nature's intrinsic, sacred value. As a result, our economic systems treat nature's resources as if they were both costless and infinite. There is no balancing feedback loop to prevent us from squandering them. In fact, it's worse than that. Das Gupta points out that governments actively subsidise the destruction of nature. Globally, he estimates, they pay between four and six trillion dollars every year towards activities that destroy nature, to agriculture, fossil fuels, fisheries, energy, fertiliser manufacturer. In economist terms, we have given nature a negative cost. We're not only failing to protect it, we are actively encouraging its destruction. But if we are to make nature visible in our farming systems, let alone place a value on it, we need to work out how to measure it in all its glorious complexity. We cannot risk our focus being so narrow that we repeat the mistakes of the past. I worry, for example, that the current maniacal focus on carbon, though understandable, might unleash a whole new set of unintended consequences if we do not value nature equally alongside it. This is why the work to create a global language to measure nature will be seen in time, I think, to be as critical as the work the International Bureau of Weights and Measures does in Paris to define the, the metrics used in chemistry and physics. There is an urgent need to recognise the central role nature plays, not just in our spiritual lives, but in our economic ones. But until we can talk about nature in the same language, we'll not be able to value it. Certainly, we won't be able to systematically restore it. Creating this common language will not be sufficient on its own to halt the decline. We need to create the right incentives too, but it is necessary, in fact, it's vital, and it's urgent. Thank you very much.